he's going to talk today about, among other things, about Pie Ranch, which is in San Mateo County. It has over 100 acres now mm -hmm. of production. Uh, basically organic, high quality, and sustainable produce. And you're also working with Google and Stanford Dining, so everyone knows about that, uh, to kind of scale markets and kind of make the best food and that's also environmentally, friend, uh, environmentally friendly. So please yeah. help me welcome Jared. Thank you. Um, thank you, Nico. Um, thank you, Skylar thank and you. Jamie. And um, you all for, for coming to this class and being interested in social entrepreneurism and kind of taking the drive to make positive change happen in the world um, a part of your life in some way. So uh, I am honored to be able to share a little bit of my background of how I got into this line of work of, of uh, ranching pies um, and uh, um, as well as kind of more into the details of, um, of what we're doing now and where we want to go uh, with uh, our version of what it means to scale the social enterprise. Um, but first, I have to ask, have any of you been to a pie ranch barn dance? A few handfuls, yes. So you've actually uh, stepped into that old 1934 packing shed and experienced the, um, what it's like to be on the coast side there. Did you get a chance to spend time walking back into the farm? You have, you've seen it, great. Well, you're all invited. Um, you just missed the last one, was this last Saturday. Um, but we have them every third Saturday of the month, um, and they're a great way to get over to some cooler uh, temperatures and um, uh, have fun dancing in a barn. Um, so, but dancing in a barn isn't the enterprise that we um, had in mind. How, however, it definitely adds to the uh, dimension of what we um, are wanting to do with our food system, which is to um, uh, reconnect people to the source of their food and have greater numbers of people, uh, you know, having more of a uh, impact through um, ha uh, having that direct relationship to where their food's coming from. So, um, but that desire for me didn't materialize until I was um, in college at UC Santa Cruz as a 19-year-old. Um, but going back further, um, what led me to UC Santa Cruz um, in the first place um, was uh, the fact that I loved going to beautiful places um, as a kid growing up in a maybe not so beautiful uh, uh, urban environment um, not far from Santa Monica Boulevard in Los Angeles in an apartment with a single mom and sister, uh, a latchkey kid going to our local elementary school and volunteering to in the cafeteria to be able to um, get my uh, daily lunch uh, at, at Westwood Elementary. Um, and I uh, loved getting um, support to go to I got a scholarship um, our, my mom to go to the YMCA camp, and I loved going to the mountains um, and spending that week uh, with uh, other friends from summer camp um, and just in, in fully uh, having like the time of my life away from the kind of stresses of um, daily life in, in LA. Um, and also my dad would take us up to Yosemite um, and, you know, we might go up for a long weekend. And I remember having those experiences, you know, away from the, the streets of L.A. and uh, sitting along the South Fork of the Merced River thinking, oh, my God, this is, na this is natural. Like, nobody put these rocks here. Nobody planted these trees. Um, this isn't a landscaped uh, environment that... Uh, you know, somebody had a hand in, but this is, this is all, this, this is just here. And recognizing that there's a large swath of the planet that, it, you know, is there that hasn't been um, touched by, by humans. This was that, at that time as, a, as a, a young kid going and being able to jump in that river and my dad saying, you, you know, just open your mouth, um, drink from the South Fork of the Merced, just the water was pure and clean enough to just to drink. And uh, it wasn't 
but a, f uh, a few years later, going back with them, that we got word that it was not okay to drink that water anymore. You had to purify it in some way because there was larger quantities of uh, intestinal parasite that you could get, um, the giardia, that would not be good um, to just drink without filtering. So, um, so speaking of water, I'll drink some more water. Um, and uh, um, I always felt better being in an environment like Yosemite or up at summer camp. Um, it was just a great feeling, and I thought it would be um, interesting going to school uh, with the topic of psychology, um, environmental psychology, and trying to understand more why is it places like that help us um, feel better. And uh, uh, the more I dug into coursework and psychology, I realized there were a lot more kind of complex systemic um, uh, causes for this uh, people's personal disease, but as well as all the other things that um, uh, you could call um, a kind of a lack of health or something out of balance. Um, and so I was, uh, you know, intrigued to be asking, um, I'm wanting to ask broader questions about, you know, what is it that um, uh, can help us as people on the planet feel better about um, being alive? Um, and what does it um, take for us to to create relationships that foster health. Um, and I, uh, as a 19-year-old, that summer between um, my freshman and sophomore year, I went and visited a friend who was apprenticing on a farm um, in Covalo in, uh, in Round Valley. And it was that week um, that I spent on that farm that was just like, oh my god, this is like what it was like at summer camp, you know, the, except, uh, I mean, they were caring people. The family was amazing. Um, the work uh, was maybe what was different, um, that every day they get up super early and uh, milk the cows and engage in the farm work, um, and grow, you know, they were growing a diversity of vegetable crops, um, and they had direct uh, relationship to where, those, uh, where their food was going. Um, and I thought this, that feeling I had being on this farm was like that feeling uh, in Yosemite or at camp but with this added dimension of economic life, of productive life, that what they were doing during the day was connected to, uh, uh, you know, uh, it had a livelihood and it was connected to people that, that were nourished by their efforts. Um, and that simple relationship, the economic relationship, stuck with me as um, a, like a profound difference in what I was interested in environmental psychology and what uh, for healthful personal relationships, realizing that this was about not only personal health, but also the health between them as individuals and their community, um, and them as individuals and the, the land around them. So the way that they farmed and the way that they took care of the soil and the water and uh, the way they nurtured those plants to be able to provide nourishment to that community was in concert with um, principles of uh, stewardship, of, of health of that ecosystem. Um, they had on site uh, all of their fertility through their animal production that fed the soil, that fed the plants um, that they harvested for their community. And that closed loop farming system and their closed loop economic system that was fully transparent. So they're members of the farm. It was a community supported agriculture farm. And all the members of that farm knew where uh, their food was coming from and also had uh, a, an understanding of the budget, and how it worked, what the farmers were paid, what their employees were paid, what it, uh, the seed costs. So it, was, it was a very simple, clear line item, budget, income and expenses, um, making that business um, something tangible that people can get a hold of. And for me, being this young kid trying to figure out how to be alive in the world in a responsible way, it seemed very um, clear. It was like, all the complex, and probably you're delving into a lot of these topics in your coursework. It's just so complex, and every system within uh, the e economic realm, and then business development and uh, production of anything has a whole complexity of, um, of uh, um, challenges that we face if we want to do it in a way 
that fosters health between those three sectors, the individual, the community, and our relationship to the earth. So that all led me to doing, spending quite a number of years with organizations that were helping to put that idea out for both the urban community as well as uh, farmers. So I helped organize uh, Western Region CSA Conference back in 1995 in San Francisco. 450 folks came. I was 25 uh, at the time. Um, so I was at, right out of school, and I was just like gung-ho to help take this idea and have it spread. Um, and I had done my senior uh, uh, thesis um, on the national community-supported agriculture um, movement and the national study, um, and uh, you know wanted to do what I could to help foster more of these kinds of uh, farms that had direct relationships with their the people eating from those farms. Um, so fast forward to um, when was it? Uh, 2003, um, I had met uh, that first photo in the intro slide, um, Nancy Vale, um, uh, earlier, 97, but we didn't kind of romantically get involved until an ecological farming conference um, in 2000 um, and, <laughs> and, um, at Asilomar, and it was at a um, barn dance, a contra dance, actually, um, and the same caller, for those of you who have been to the barn dances, Andy, who's the caller at our barn dances, was the caller that night down in Monterey. Um, and uh, he, uh, it's going to get a little too cheesy, but he at um, one point, um, and I wasn't dancing with Nancy. And as barn dances go, and this might entice some of you to come out, you're not necessarily dancing with the same partner all the time, and it's moving around. Um, and so suddenly I was dancing with the person I wanted to be dancing with, um, and right then, uh, Andy said, uh, dance like you mean it. Um, and we kind of like looked at each other. And, and uh, literally the next day, we were talking about starting an educational farm. Um, and I was working at the time uh, and starting a family. And I was working at the time at uh, the Center for Eco-Literacy in Berkeley. And she was at, at the farm at the university at UCSC. And so we'd commute back and forth to visit each other and um, up and down the, the stretch of coast, uh, Highway 1, beautiful strip. Right here, um, you can see that the one line, main line down the most, mostly the middle there is Highway 1. This is Año Nuevo Point. And right up in that top corner there is the a little pie slice wedge. Can you see it? Um, I don't have a, a pointer or a clicker, but um, there's a little wedge. Maybe it'll, it'll come in. Now that's a little more obvious. There, the little pie slice up here. It's just 14 acres. So this is, we thought all we would need in order to invite young people out to the farm to experience um, the similar kinds of experiences that I had as a teenager. Um, so it's high school age is who we focused on. Um, and we wanted to start uh, an educational farm for, for young people to train new farmers and to do this kind of regional work to foster more of these kinds of direct relationships. Um, it's another picture of the pie slice. Um, and that year, after we got onto the land, uh, uh, three weeks after we started, um, uh, Lucas here was um, conceived. And there he was. That fall, we were able to get the um, cover crops planted in, um, in October of 2004, and then got to work um, building health, healthy soil and building uh, infrastructure for animals and putting in crops that um, could help be the manifestation of that pie slice wedge. So we had to grow crops like strawberries. I don't know how many of you like strawberry rhubarb pie. All right. Um, pumpkin pie, anyone? So we also had to grow ingredients, other ingredients for pies like wheat for the crust and eggs for the filling, especially for those um, pumpkin pies, and uh, have dairy for the butter for the crust as well as for the filling. Um, and there you have a pumpkin pie. Um, and we started a social enterprise with a pie shop. Our co-founder, Karen Heisler, 
started a pie shop in San Francisco called Mission Pie, and that was a for-profit, and we started Art the Farm and Educational Programming as a non-profit. And um, the high school youth uh, who were involved in coming to the farm from Mission High School were involved in learning what it takes to create a small bakery and cafe in the Mission District of San Francisco. There's our, our daughter, Rosa, and some of the students from those first classes that came out in 2005 um, from Mission High. Um, we also are, uh, invite um, folks to come and spend the whole year with us if you're wanting to become a uh, skilled practitioner in this kind of diversified small-scale production. So we offer apprenticeships for uh, emerging farmers. Um, and, um, and yeah, so for over the last 10, 11 years now, since we started the educational programs, we have, we've maintained a relationship three, uh, with three in-depth partner schools, um, about 1,700 students per year that come to the farm. Um, and then we have in the summer um, uh, paid internships for the high school youth to spend uh, eight weeks in the summer working with us and learning more of the, what it takes to, to run the farm. As well as this year we're dividing into tracks so that they, if they're interested in culinary they could end up um, pursuing a, a career path in uh, other ways to relate to food and farming. Um, our apprentices, um, this year we actually have uh, seven apprentices. Um, with us. Um, so, so, yeah, since 2007 we've had, um, well, now over 78 um, graduates. And a lot of them are out. You know, this is one way of scaling our kind of social enterprises, creating new leaders to be able to do that themselves. And a number of them have their own businesses or are in management roles on, on um, other farms. And then um, we do, I spend a good amount of my time helping to develop uh, regional partnerships. So working with um, our, uh, there's a group called the San Mateo Food Systems Alliance. And we engage in a lot of um, uh, projects and policy development that will help make the conditions a little easier for new farms to get started, people to access land and capital um, to be, build their own enterprise, as well as um, uh, create greater accessibility for the foods that are being grown on these farms to um, uh, their institutions. And then we also do other kinds of ways of connecting with our, our community. And if we have time at the end, I can share more about that. Um, but I thought it would take a, a, a moment from just hearing me um, sharing and uh, listen to some of the other voices of, um, of the farm. So I don't know if uh, we need to turn the lights down, but we want to, we can. Oops. I think that that's something that's really special about Pie Ranch. They've created this mini ecosystem within our larger ecosystem we all exist in. And the conditions are right within that ecosystem for everyone to play their unique part, but to really contribute together in this very meaningful way that's leading towards you know, transformational change. <laughs> I've had this feeling, like a lot of us, that our food system is broken, our education system is broken. You know, I think we're all looking for ways to fix it. And coming down here, I think it's, what I really felt was, this isn't just a possibility, this is what's really happening here. Kids are learning, and great food is being produced, and that there's this incredible connection in the community down here. So the mission of Pie Ranch, to reconnect people to their food and a greater number of people to their food. You see it through their three programs so beautifully. You see it as they're educating young people, bringing them to the farm. You see it as they're educating the next generation of farmers. And you see it as they're thinking about what the landscape looks like going forward and what their land access work. When you take all of that together, you see that Pie Ranch is really pushing for systemic change in our food system. It's a unique place because in addition to having a really wide variety of crops, they also have all these other elements like animals and direct marketing and farm stand at CSA and they do events and then pie. <laughs> pie Ranch provides an educational experience to kids that they would not get in any other way. Uh, they get to plant, they get to harvest, they get to eat, they get an understanding of 
how the earth actually works. It's just so fun out here. You get to enjoy nature, do a little bit of work, and eat. You can just go like this and hold, like, hold it to the side, put the potato in. We just got started, and I have a feeling I'm going to be sweating a lot more than I am now by the time we get halfway. <laughs> they encourage you to become like, not, not like a big change in the world, but at, but at least in your own life. Even though we come from a different background, different places, we come here and we get together as a, as a group, as a family. The stuff I learned in these two days, I would probably never learn my whole life if I didn't come here. At Pie Ranch, we are training new farmers so that they can go out there with the skills and concepts and passion needed to transform the food system. So their role in terms of training the next generation of farmers to be good stewards of the land, to grow organic food, to be able to make a living is, I think, incredibly important. I've been here for eight months almost now, and you think, okay, my knowledge is going to plateau. Nope. I just keep learning and learning and learning. It still would dry down and that wouldn't affect, it shouldn't affect the quality of the, of the wheat. I am successfully running uh, my own farm with two partners, and uh, Pie Ranch is critical to where I'm at now. It's not just you know learning how to plant a seed in the ground and care for it, but it's also about how you care for your community and, um, and build a better one together. Stanford grad, Stanford grad. We see this next generation of farmers coming in. And these are people who have a new approach to farming that's very integrated and they're popping up all over the place and it's the growing momentum, a critical mass, you know, and I want to make sure that they stay here. <laughs> so land access, particularly for new farmers, is going to be a really important policy initiative that we need to work on. We don't know all the details, we don't know exactly what we need to do or the mechanisms and how that is going to happen, but it's something that's really important and I know uh, Jared Pine Ranch is at the forefront of trying to get this done. Just like we need protected park space for our psychological well-being and be able to play and recreate, we need to preserve that uh, productive farmland so that we know that we have that resource to provide uh, our communities with the food that it needs. We want good food, we're asking for good food, and the only way that we're going to be able to have it is if this land and the San Mateo Corridor is preserved. It's our responsibility as food educators, as farmers, to make it happen. And we have to make it happen. Every month at Pie Ranch, we host a community work day and a potluck and a barn dance. It just taps into that desire for people to celebrate. is very significant, not just for San Mateo County, but for California. There are still buildings that are reminiscent to the family, and because of that, there's a priority in that they would be preserved. The last Steele family member to live in this house was Catherine Steele, and her husband, Will Steele, was born in this house and he died in the house. And his dying wish was that the house and the surrounding buildings and the land around it be preserved for the public to come and breathe the air of the Pioneer West. Fast forward to now, Pie Ranch, we have that chance to restore this as a real working farm. This is an incredible gem of a uh, piece of land. It's got these old, beautiful, historic buildings that are in need of repair, and we feel like we can not only help keep them alive, but repurpose them to serve this bigger vision around food system change. In our short amount of time, we've been able to serve a number of people here at Pie Ranch, but we feel like with just a bit more investment into the infrastructure, we can serve a lot more. The role that they have in both the teaching and demonstrating, and at the same time providing a good product, it is really the model for the future. Pie Ranch is such a shining example of integrating all kinds of concerns in 
the farming enterprise. And I think it's just so satisfying, so deeply satisfying to me to see that happening. The more we can invest in places like Pike Ranch, the more we're all going to benefit in terms of a food supply that is healthy, sustainable, and uh, going to be there for a long time. I look forward to the day when most of the food that we consume comes from places that we know. You know and if we can help in, one, in whatever little way um, to make that come about, that's our, that's our goal. helped hopefully to make it come to life a little bit more. Um, oops. Like the ecosystem. For everyone to play their unique part. There we go. Um, so we feel really good about having a place that over the last 10 years has uh, been viable. Like we have uh, a growing team, we have 30 staff now that help with all the different programs that we've been running. But we also felt unsatisfied um, that somehow the number of youth that are coming and apprentices that are heading out into the world, like we aren't really moving the needle on that sort of transformative change that we allude to wanting to. It's our mission, cultivate a more healthy and just food system from seed to table. So how you, you know, we could keep at this for the next, you know, 40 years, and I don't think we'd transform the food system. Um, so we got invited to participate in this innovation lab at Google on, uh, uh, it's called the Google Food Lab um, now. It was the innovation lab for food experience um, when we started three years ago. And uh, the food team at Google for their you know, company large organization meal program wanted to leverage that program to help accomplish positive change in the world. And I thought, wow, if Google wants to do that, maybe we can start to move the needle on, on food system change if the sort of values and principles that we're embedding in our model can somehow transfer to their model. Um, and uh, uh, we were invited to share ideas that might that they might help take up and invest in and be a part of manifesting. And so I threw out this idea of CSA 2.0. Um, so take you know, that experience I had as a 19 year old up in Covalo on this farm, like you know, one farm, small farm with maybe 100 households that commit to that farm. Can we take that, those values, that transparent economics of the production system all the way through to consumption and make that part of this large organization cafeteria. Could they act like a household um, would in a CSA relationship and make that kind of commitment up front to, to not only our farm, but uh, say an aggregation of other farms. And so that's, um, uh, in so doing, we also thought we could scale our production um, to meet that increased demand. So we only have about a 60 member CSA and run and sell produce at the farm stand off of the 27 acres that we um, were farming. So that first 14 acres, we acquired the lower slice through a, um, a campaign. And, and then, um, but of that 27 acres, we're not really producing enough to make a dent at all in the meal program at Google um, or Stanford. Um, so we had this opportunity to take over a lease of a farm across the street and, um, you know, basically, uh, you know, by a factor of 10, increase our, our production uh, in one year. Um, but we could only do that with the help of this, of the team of employees that the Garibaldi family, who had, um, because of the consequences of NAFTA, um, uh, don't have, okay, right, because we want to get to Q&A. Um, the consequences of NAFTA, um, which we can go into if we have time in the Q&A, um, kind of led their production uh, model um, uh, to not be competitive anymore with that, those of um, South American floral production. Um, 
um, and without going into reasons, deeper reasons of why. Um, I'd love to show you just again, and I'll, I'll cut my other slide just a little shorter so that you can hear some of the voices um, beyond mine of, of the Google and other folks who are involved in uh, helping to get this um, scaled version of what we're trying to do happening across the street. So we'll do one more film, and then maybe we'll open it up to, to Q&A. Uh, yeah, Garibaldi family came over from Italy in 1892. I'm the fourth generation, my son and daughter the fifth. Our family came to Pescadero to grow in this nice ranch 44 years ago. The farm market was good in the early days and we did it for 40 something years and, and we're successful at it. At one time there were 48 vendors that grew their own stuff. Then it started changing. South America got involved. Everything we grew, they grew. And they grew it better and cheaper. In the last 10 years, when the business kind of started going south, and then the decision was made a year ago to call it quits, and it was pretty hard, didn't you? 68 years going to the market, and you just cold turkey quit. One fine generation has been doing this. That was hard to take. Over the last 10 years, we at Tire Ranch have developed a diverse operation and educational farm. And we have been looking for a partner to scale what we've learned to a sustainable working farm. The Onion Nuevo site offers a perfect venue to do this. Out of nowhere, this nice gentleman living across the street from us came in to visit us. We stopped talking, and immediately we hit it off. We said, this is going to work. We're not just looking at um, creating a sustainable farm, um, but we're really wanting to have, from production all the way through to consumption, be sustainable. We needed the upfront operating capital and customer base to make this idea a reality. One of the unique aspects of Google being located on Mountain View is we're so close to so many great farms. And what we're trying to do over here is to provide Googlers with delicious, nutritious local food, but it can make the connection with food as well. So as a large organization, we have committed that we're gonna buy this year and over the years to come a large part of his farm production up front. So we're providing with the cash flow, so actually he doesn't have to worry about will he be able to pay the bills as he's waiting for his crops to grow. This project is giving us the opportunity to develop a, an innovative CSA. In a traditional CSA, you have a group of customers in the community who support the farm financially throughout the season and in return get a share of the harvest. Google is committing in advance like a CSA member would. This not only allows us to take the best care of the land, but also the people who are working the land. I get to keep my crew, and that meant a lot. I told Jared, I'm on board only if you keep these guys, because if not, I don't want to stay, you know. Without them, we're nothing. They know the soil, they know the systems. If it weren't for them, we would not be able to hit the ground running and growing the diversity of crops that we wanted. It helps that local community, Pescadero, to remain viable. It helps us to connect actually Googlers with the original food a farmer. We're going to be able to integrate what's being eaten in the cafe during the day coming from the farm with what can be taken home by an employee uh, over the weekend. The Schmidt Family Foundation's mission is to support programs that are environmentally and economically viable and support local communities which is why we're working closely with the two partners, Tire Ranch and Google, to prototype a new financing model that enables smaller farms to sell their produce upfront and directly to large organizations and stabilize their cash flows. So the Schmidt Family Foundation has played a critical role by providing this financing 
and that helps us take care of some of the immediate needs of getting started, like buying equipment. But beyond that, this allows us to develop a whole new supply chain option for farmers. We're excited we've got our first planting of wheat and barley and vegetable crops like the peas and baba beans and chard and kale. Um, so we're, we're rolling. Now the ranch I look, it's like, okay, we've got wheat growing out there, and it's like, okay, that's a first. I've never seen it. Or you know, eventually they have animals and pasture. It's like, wow. <laughs> you know? But I'm excited about it. it it's, it's a change in the right direction. We're going to continue on as far as we can go. We're just super excited about the potential of, of having this model move us from an anonymous food system to one where relationships help to drive sustainability. So success for me would be if large organizations over in the Bay Area, in the U.S. or around the world, would actually learn from this model and apply it and probably do it even better than we can imagine ourselves today. Hey. So I'll kind of end there. We'll go into the rest of the slides and just say that um, we're incredibly grateful to, for the opportunity to trial this. Uh, we're in our third season with Google and our second season now um, with uh, Stanford Dining. So there's a similar large commitment from um, you all and if those of you who eat in the facilities. Um, a portion of your food dollars is going to this project awesome and then we uh, just are formalizing three new contracts with Palantir in Palo Alto here, um, Airbnb in San Francisco and Thumbtack in San Francisco as well with the ultimate goal of trying to make this kind of large organization model relevant to our original and closer to our heart not to say that employees of these companies aren't uh, becoming closer to our heart but are the people who we've been working with um, uh, in the schools um, over the last 10 years are um, uh, the teachers, faculty, and the students who we've built relationships with us. We'd like to see this model uh, become viable f um, uh, for their large organization cafeterias. So school food, um, a lot more challenging. Um, and if we had another class time, we could get into unpacking that one. But, um, but uh, we're excited, and this is our way that we want to see this social enterprise scale. Um, and we are building that with other farms now, too. There's going to be three coastal farms and three um, valley farms from the Cape Bay Valley Farm Shop. And we're the part in the film where I talk about um, the, the employees will be able to take home a, a meal kit over the weekend, or say they can take the same food home and, and prepare it um, over the weekend. Um, that's, we got a grant recently from the USDA to start prototyping what that would look like. And so just for short, it's kind of like, um, I don't know if are you familiar with like the Blue Aprons or other kind of meal kit services. Um, it's like that, but with the social and ecological um, uh, um, values of the CSA model embedded in that um, meal kit. So um, let's open it up for questions. We have, I think, another 15 minutes. Right, excellent question. Um, so as we scale, are we uh, planning to scale our production to compete with large, other large-scale farms, or is there a, um, some implicit uh, viability um, with small, medium-scale farms in this model? Um, we uh, definitely, as we've grown from a small to a, a, a larger small farm, um, we, we want to stay in the small to medium scale range and then aggregate um, multiple farms into um, you know, being able to provide the consistency and quality required for these large organization cafeterias and their, um, the, the orders um, and have the efficiencies help be competitive on price point. Um, but also um, combining the wholesale pricing with the retail pricing of a meal kit, um, uh, adding that value that's owned by the production, um, by the farm community, 
that's where we feel like that enterprise will be able to be viable. So combining that retail and wholesale price points um, will make it uh, viable to compete with just an industrial scale um, monocrop farm. So we're definitely not there yet, and, that, and that's one of the areas that we've been struggling with is, is you know, to not just be a small fraction of the uh, food orders for any um, cafeteria. Um, uh, we, we have to be, you know, it, it has to be affordable for that food business to be able to work with us. So well, that's where we're trying to find that sweet spot, and um, we're, we're hopeful we'll get there. Being at Silicon Valley, we try to approach a lot of the world's problems with how technology can make this future better. Mm -hmm. And always the hunger is one of the world's uh, leading problems. Yeah. And we are lucky here that we have the option to decide between organic, inorganic food, what type of food. But in a lot of places in the world, they just need food. Right. And when we think of that, kind of genetically modified nutrition seem like a feasible solution to approach the hunger problem. What are your thoughts about that? Oh, that's a, um, another great question that uh, would take a, another whole class to unpack, but I'll do my best at trying to um, offer a quick response. Um, I feel like the uh, genetic uh, technologies that are owned by a, a very small um, select group of companies um, doesn't create food sovereignty, which actually would um, allow for uh, uh, longer term, more... Uh, most of the world's uh, farmers are small-scale farmers and subsistence farmers. Um, so to enable uh, them to adopt this technology would create a dependence on a, on a distant source of seed that's, um, that they can't save themselves and use from year, from year to year. So it creates a, a false sense of security just by the notion that they might increase yields um, uh, when rather this kind of biologically-based diversified system that's, um, that has seeds that can be sown year after year, owned by the community, is by far a much more, um, I think, long-term viable option for solving the hunger problem. And most of the hunger in the world is not caused by the lack of uh, productive land. It's um, caused by the, the uh, lack of control of that land and the lack of control of the means and modes of production. Anyone else? <laughs> Ah, uh, so sorry, I forgot to repeat the last one. Hopefully it came through in the response. Um, uh, if I understand your question is, um, uh, do we want to scale? I know that you want to scale, but are there limits, limits to, to, to the scaling? The quality, and the and that's a really good question too. We're, um, the question is, um, can, can we, um, uh, do we want, what are the limits to, to scaling um, our production model? And we don't know that yet, though we do know um, that the greater number of people um, who are uh, in, engaged in their own startup, that you have a lot more incentive like to, to, make, to do it well. Um, and so our vision is to have a lot more um, social entrepreneurs in the ag world have what to them is a meaningful life uh, that they can have a good uh, uh, earn a good living off of a certain amount of land that is appropriately scaled and that's what we're trying to figure out what that is and we don't know if it's 150 acres 250 acres of this sort of integrated cropping and livestock system that we're working on um, with these kinds of committed markets, but if we can come up with a replicable template, that's that's what we're striving for, at least in the, in our area. It's obviously going to be different in different parts of the um, the state, and different parts of the U.S. and different parts of the world. But um, uh, our goal, if is to create a robust and healthy local food system, um, that's that's what we're trying to figure. What is that right? Is there a sweet spot for for um, the size of an operation? Um, 
so the question was, um, how, did, how did we get going with um, our, the resources to get the farm started and um, the team and, and whatnot? Um, we uh, started really small. It was just my wife and I and our friend, Karen. Um, she had the financial resources through inheritance of property in Carmel and was able to transfer that equity into acquiring the 14 acres that we started on. Um, and we arranged for um, a payback to her. It was a personal loan. Um, uh, but combination of sweat equity um, and, um, and then cash loan. Um, and I can go into details of that if you're interested. Um, and then um, we uh, kept the day job. Nancy still worked at the university um, full time. And I was um, full time getting the farm and nonprofit going. And then like most in fact, I'm going to be talking about this tomorrow in the Sears Fellowship class on leadership, at like how in the beginnings you wear multiple hats, and we're doing everything from the admin of running a nonprofit organization, getting our 501c3 status, reaching out to their school partners, providing that experience on the farm, getting the equipment, sowing the crops, the, like everything I was doing with help from Nancy when she could, with help from Karen when she could. Um, uh, and then we started to grow by growing our team of um, apprentices who are um, in, a, in a way being like, I imagine you all, if you do internships, sometimes you can get paid internships and sometimes you can. And ours were um, paid, but not well. It was just a stipend. Um, and, but they're, so they're learning a lot and we're teaching them a lot, but they are contributing a lot to the viability of the farm early on. Um, and then we have uh, grow grew our programming. Part of our strategy to be viable early was to leverage our experience of developing meaningful programming and educational experiences, because that has value to uh, d uh, funders um, and to, to school communities that can afford it. So we had a fee-for-service structure that brought in more income. There's a lot more viable than selling you know, a bunch of carrots. So we wanted that bunch of carrots to have relevance and have an, part of our earned income stream, but we knew that wasn't going to cover our um, desire for a, um, a, you know, a, a fair salary for us to do this work full time. So um, a combination of, of um, pulling different resources together. And then as soon as we started attract, you know, putting the word out for um, when we had more income and we had enough to be able to hire other team members, we've just you know, over the last 10 years have grown from just that core of three, really one, one and a half FTE, full time, you know, equivalent to, to um, now like close to 35 people who, who work with us to make it happen. So there's a lot of letting go now of those responsibilities and getting to focus on fun projects like this. Um, That's great. Um, I did go up to one of the food innovation labs we ha was held in Seattle. So I don't know if that's how far north that you're thinking of. <laughs> um, it's still west coast. There's a lot more moisture, but there's an incredible ag community around Seattle and other metropolitan areas throughout the U.S. Tremendous amount of agricultural land still. And I mean, the U.S. were quite fortunate, even though it's hard to grow in the winter. Um, it's still possible especially with some of the kind of uh, other appropriate um, technologies that can enhance um, that are coming out of the valley or coming out of um, other uh, ag schools um, uh, to, to make it possible to uh, do indoor growing of, with some fresh vegetables. Um, uh, but I do feel like a lot of the ag in areas that have more seasonality um, used to be able to do it. And it's only because we've gotten used to being able to ship produce all over the world, um, burning up a lot of fossil fuels, creating a lot of carbon um, in the atmosphere that um, is uh, causing other problems that we're having now to contend with. That if we uh, um, created a, a more carbon friendly local food system, we'd figure out ways to have that diversity again in, in places where you have shorter growing season. We have friends in Alaska who are who are doing this on a small scale. Um, you obviously don't have big, maybe they, they could tie in with the university in Fairbanks or something, but I think there, there's, um, 
that problem, I think, is, is um, solvable. Uh, and it's just a matter of uh, taking away some of those entrenched uh, supports that happen through our farm bill every five years that further pushes farms into growing commodity crops uh, with false crop insurance. I mean, it's just a, it's a crazy system that's gotten set up to why we have what we have. It's not just free market forces, if that's, you know, um, the, the rationale for, for being able to, like, continue with the kind of global food system that we have. It's definitely been manipulated and supported with particular financial interests from, um, from uh, the uh, folks involved in crafting that, those, those policies. Okay, time for one more question. Um, I think, so his question is, what are the biggest challenges going forward? Um, I think one of, in a way, maybe it's too easy off the back of the last question to, to um, answer it in this way, but I feel like the unfair uh, system that we currently have that's propped up by policies that are created to foster a particular kind of system, um, that our challenge is to, uh, to undo that and level the playing field and make for ideas like this to find the kind of uh, support that it needs to, to um, uh, to, to grow and succeed and that we don't have to struggle as much as we do in order to um, make these um, projects. So we feel very fortunate to have partners like Google and Stanford to uh, you know, overcome those barriers, um, but for this to really take off and to enter into other areas of uh, other communities, um, we, we need to figure out new policies. So one of the ways we're working on that is through the San Mateo Food Systems Alliance. Um, we, put forward this idea of um, a local food and farm bill. So instead of relying on um, the slow change of entrenched policy at the federal level, why don't we develop our own uh, version of it that reflected our values and um, our interests locally. So all those groups of stakeholders that go to these monthly meetings, we're in the process right now of, of, of crafting that. And one of the serious, one of the students in this fellow, the social entrepreneurs class with um, Kathleen Janice is uh, helping us uh, work on that, looking at good policies from, from the federal level all the way down to the local level that could be re recrafted into a comprehensive version of the Farm Bill um, so to help overcome some of those barriers. But it's not just policy alone. It's got a, you know, this training program, access to land, access to capital. But policy can help, um, help a lot. Look at that. It is 6.30 on the nest. Um, I really enjoy getting to share our story a little bit, and I know there's an opportunity for continued conversations. Um, and uh, you're all very much invited to come out to visit any time. We're open seven days a week. So if you ever find yourself in our neighborhood, please come by and visit. Um, and then if you care to uh, frolic in a 1930s packing shed barn, and on every third Saturday of the month here. Yeah. Please come out and join us. Yeah. Okay.